Let's get joined up. Today's show is brought to you by Audible, and right now you can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash joined up. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle or MP3 player. So thanks for tuning in to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, a regular show about all things writing, including interviews with authors, screenwriters and key figures from the publishing industry. Plus loads of hints, tips and inspiration for all creatives. You can follow us on Twitter at JU Podcast, leave a quick iTunes review or just tell a friend. Yes, hello and welcome to the Joined Up Writing Podcast, where a little procrastination can go a long way. I'm Wayne Kelly and it's episode 154 with Helen Paris, author of new novel Lost Property. Helen's got a really interesting backstory of her own and loads of inspirational words on the creative process. Before we hear the interview, a few words from me. (laughs) A few words from me, ironic, since I'm still yet to write more than a few new words of fiction, despite moaning about it every time I do one of these intros. I saw a tweet from past guest, Rod Duncan over the weekend and it and it perfectly encapsulated how I'm currently feeling. He said, that thing when you feel the call of creativity but don't quite have the willpower or self-belief to make the first move and actually start creating. Well, that's exactly how I feel at the moment. I feel like there's something building inside, bursting to get out. I really want to write, but I just don't know what that is or which thing I should be working on. I've actually made an effort this week and started to write a short story, but trying to write the first couple of paragraphs was like pulling teeth. Despite the logical, rational part of my brain telling me, this is only for you, it's a first draft, it can be crap, just get on, get it on the page. A much louder voice was screaming, why are you writing this terrible story idea? You don't even know what you're going to do with it. What's the point? You're only going to abandon it halfway through anyway. You might as well not bother. Uh, so it was not an enjoyable experience and at the minute that's what I'm really trying to get back to a time when I could sit down and write for the sheer hell of it the joy you get from that spontaneous burst of creativity you know when the words and ideas are flowing so easily it it makes you giggle Um, and that's why I wanted to have a go at writing a short story rather than worrying about what novel to work on But maybe I'm still setting my expectations too high. I should just go back to morning pages or write a journal and see if that gets my mojo back. Or maybe I should stop trying to force it, you know, stop trying to be so desperate to find the right idea and just wait until something grabs me enough that I've got no choice but to write it. I don't know. What do you lot think? Uh, Do I need to just get a grip and crack on? Anyone else been struggling like this since last year and the pandemic and everything else? I'd really appreciate hearing from you, so please share your experiences, offer advice, or just have a moan like I seem to be doing every week at the minute. It doesn't matter, just get in touch. And you can do that by tweeting me at JUPodcast, emailing wayne at waynekellywrites.com, or dropping me a line on the FB page. Also, don't forget to join the email mailing list at joinedupwriting.co.uk. It's totally free, and you get a couple of downloadable goodies when you sign up as well as being the first to find out about upcoming shows and events. Okay, let's change it up with a lovely big helping of positivity and hear today's interview with Helen Paris. So Helen worked in the performing arts for two decades, touring internationally with her London-based theatre company, Curious. After several years living in San Francisco and working as a theatre professor at Stanford University, she returned to the UK to focus on writing fiction. As part of her research for a performance called Lost and Found, Helen shadowed employees at the Baker Street Lost Property Office for a week, an experience that sparked her imagination and inspired her new novel, Lost Property, which is out everywhere you can find good books. So enjoy the conversation, and I'll pop back at the end to sign off. Okay, Helen, thanks so much for joining me on Joined Up Writing. Really appreciate it. So why don't you just start off just telling us whereabouts you're speaking from and give us a sense of how things are going for you at the minute. Hello, Wayne. Yes, thanks very much for having me. Well, I am physically, I'm sort of on top 
of a wedding cake slice of a row of terraced houses on the southeast coast. Nice description. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. And I'm looking right as I'm speaking to you. Um, I'm looking out at the sea and Europe in the distance, which always gives me a feeling of joy. Um, and what what I'm up to is I'm um, I'm working on my next novel, and I'm really looking forward to uh, Lost Property, which is coming out on the 13th of May. And um, when I'm not writing, I'm spending I'm sort of spending a lot of time sort of vicariously traveling. I uh, invested in this Nordic track trainer, which I'm so glad, you know, this is before yeah. lockdown and it's really helped get me through lockdown. And so this morning, for example, I've been hiking on the Swiss Alps oh, with wow. my, and yes, with my trainer, Tommy. And it's great, you know, you have to do some work. You have to sort of imagine the Alpine air, but, you know, I can <laughs> definitely feel that pulling oh, my calf. So is that like a, it's got like a virtual environment then or something? Ex- with it? Exactly. So oh, it's like, brilliant. you know, it's, it's this, um, you know, you can you can choose where you want to go, and it comes up on the iPad. You know, and so I spend a lot of time I've, at the moment. I'm spending a lot of time up in the Swiss Alps, which is great. You know, who can blame you? Yeah, it sounds <laughs> great, and getting fit in the process as well. There you go. Yes. Well, well, you mentioned lost property there. Obviously, you said it's coming out on the 13th of May. Well, just give us a tell, tell us a little bit about that. What's the premise? Okay. Well, it's um, it's the story of Dot Watson. And she um, works in the Transport for London Lost Property office in London's Baker Street, where she um, spends her days very efficiently dealing with all the lost brollies and bags and phones that are left behind on the London Underground in the in the buses and black cabs and, and trains as well as on the tube. And um, yes, yeah, so Dot spends her days diligently logging and labelling each item that comes in, whether it's... Um, you know, whether it's an expensive leather wallet or a very mediocre English essay, she <laughs> tags them, she shelves them in the cavernous basements of Lost Property where they then wait to be um, found. Um, and she is, uh, it, it, she's very dedicated to her job, even though she doesn't, at the Lost Property office, they don't have a uniform as such. She has She's gone ahead and fashioned her own, um, which is in felt because she finds it a very supportive fabric. <laughs> um, and she has her favourite words, which are sellotape, super glue, and safety pin because she finds that they are words that do a very good job of keeping things safe uh-huh. and stop them from becoming lost. Because the more we get to know Dot Watson, the more we learn that she is as lost as the items that she diligently spends her days cataloging. Brilliant. Well, it sounds like a great setting and a, and a great premise. So, and, and am I right in thinking that it was kind of inspired after you spent a bit of time at a lost property office? Yes, it was. Um, I was doing, um, it was, it was some years ago now, but I was doing, um, some research for a theatre project that I was making about um, loss. And I have always been really interested in objects and sort of the memories that objects hold, um, you know, how a pipe or a bag or a small purse can contain um, a, a memory um, moment or a trace of a, of a person that's um, beloved or a place that's beloved. Mm-hmm. And how objects can be sort of portals um, through which, you know, the memories that we connect with them can almost take us back to the people or the place um, that we connect them to and almost let them sort of return to that place or that person and linger there if only for a moment. And of course, the cavernous basements of Lost Property in Baker Street are filled floor to ceiling with some with 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 all these lost objects all waiting to be found um each one sporting a mustard colored label so it was such an extraordinary place to be to think about loss and i so i worked there for a week sort of shadowing the shadowing the staff and it just the place and the people and the business of it really took up residence in my imagination and stayed there long after that theatre project was over. So much so that one day Dot Watson sort of tapped me on the shoulder and sort of politely inquired if I might have just left something behind in Nost Property. And indeed I had. It turned out I'd left this whole novel behind. Yeah. 
um, because I mean, Wayne, it's such, it's such, it's like a sort of a emporium or cathedral of loss, the basements of lost property yeah. and Baker Street. Um, and, you know, you can imagine, you know, I could have, I think it, I could have done the novel and imagined um, what, what, what things might be there. I could imagine the lost brollies and the lost phones or the lost shopping bags. But I don't think I would ever have guessed at the false teeth or the um, two and a half hundred weight of sultanas or the <laughs> jar of bull sperm that, you know, have made their way down there, you know, because at the end of the day, we all know that truth is stranger than fiction. Yeah. You know, and the other things that I learned just by being there for this tiny week, you know, um, how seasons are marked by loss, you know, the the mislaid umbrellas that flood in during winter and then and then this sort of flurry of um, tennis rackets during the Wimbledon season. <laughs> um, and how, you know, how now um, mobile phones, of course, are what uh, are now the items that are most lost, whereas it used to be old copies of A to Z, you know, um, or, or umbrellas. So, um, so really thinking about how this place is really charts loss in so many ways, but also the people that worked there, I was really touched by the level of care and attention that the lost property staff gave, no matter what it was that had been lost, whether it was a diamond ring or whether it was a, you know, a teddy bear with one eye out and half its stuffing missing, you know, value was apportioned equally. And this level of care and attention being paid really struck me and is very much threaded through Lost Property, the novel, very much threaded through the character of Dot Watson, who really pays attention to the people and to the objects that they have, um, that they've lost. And I suppose it's kind of like a, a writer's dream anyway, a place like that, because for every single item uh, there's a there's a story attached to it you know it, and and a story that you can imagine you can just pick up an item and think well who might have been carrying that and where might they have been going and what their might their life have been like and all the rest of it absolutely absolutely it it really is it's sort of a gift of a place you know and what i really struck me as well how important the details are how you describe the object because it's those details that get put on that little um, a lost property tag that gets attached to each of the items down there. Um, I remember this woman coming in once and she was looking for, uh, I think it was a wedding shoe. And she was very precise. She was saying that the shoe was the shoe that she'd lost, you know, she it was ivory, but it was really pale. It wasn't like a pump. It was like a shoe shoe. It was a size three. And she said, you know, it was called, a, it was on the receipt. She said, I remember it was called a junior shoe. And then suddenly she started rootling away in her bag. And she said, oh, actually, I've still got the receipt, you know. <laughs> and she and she pulled it out, you know, as if suddenly that having the proof of purchase might even, you know, yeah. make the shoe itself appear, you know. Yeah. But, you know, you realise that actually she was absolutely spot on to be so precise in her description. Um, because the more precise, you know, you can be, the more details you can give, the greater your success of having your item returned to you. And, um, you know, and I, I really, I really took that on. So, you know, Dot Watson says, you know, if you write woman's handbag dappled burgundy rather than woman's handbag red, it yeah. can make all the difference as to whether that bag is reunited with the owner or languishes in lost property forever. You know, those details really matter. So, so absolutely, it was such a rich resource for me. Um, you know, and I, my, my background is as a performance maker. Um, so, uh, so setting is really important to me when I think about making a piece of work. And that has really also then, you know, infused, um, infused my writing my novel writing as well the importance of place the importance of setting absolutely and when you I know you only spent a short time there but during that time did you see many people get reunited with their items yes I did I mean it's 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 surprising how many um items are handed in you know I love I sort of I was quite moved you know by mm. people you know what it you know what it's like to be in a big city as well to schlepping all the way you know to, yeah. to Baker Street to hand in somebody's lost keys on just sort of the, the hope that you know somebody might come in looking for them so I found that I found that quite touching and yes those moments when people were reunited with their objects was was 
was wonderful, especially I think, you know, for me, those moments when, when the object itself seems quite humble, mm. you know, that it's not, it wasn't the the the, uh, the iPhone or the the leather wallet, you know, it really it was the it it was the um, the I I remember a, a chap coming in and it was he was looking for his he was looking for his wallet, but it wasn't about the money and I think he said there was just a fiver in it, but what it had was his, pictures of his family mm. who were in Poland, and it was that's what that's what he yeah. was that's what he was missing, you know, and and um. That really struck me, and 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 again, absolutely bled through into into the story of Lost Property. What what really sort of sets Dot Watson on her journey is that one day, um, an elderly gentleman called Mr. Appleby comes in because he's lost his hold all. He thinks he left it on the seventy three bus, but you know, and what's in there is um, the Times newspaper and um, a couple of other things. But what really has brought him to lost property is not getting the hold all itself it's getting what's inside it which is um this little purse and it's this empty purse that belongs to his late wife mm-hmm. and it's that that he wants back and it's that fact that really strikes a chord with dot watson because she she knows that what how an object can be this sort of as, as i was saying earlier how an object can almost be a portal back to a person that's lost and she herself has um a very strong connection to her dad's Dunhill pipe, which she still has and still occasionally dips her nose in the, the bowl of the pipe and has that little whiff of cherry tobacco. So, you know, so so that so that and it's it's that story, it's that quest to try and find um, Mr. Appleby's um, hold all and actually to try and find his his wife's purse is what leads start on the journey of her own having to face her own heartbreaking loss. And and absolutely that was completely inspired by stories like like the man wanting his wallet because what he really wanted was those photographs of his family. Absolutely. I'd like to see the sentimental um story of the guy coming back for his bag of sultanas. That would have been <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the novel. No. That's gotta be the sequel, surely. <laughs> Absolutely. What were you doing with that the of sultanas? Yeah. Just the idea the idea of someone handing those in is funny to me. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, but even I funnier would be that. somebody going to collect them. Coming to collect them, yeah, that's right. <laughs> You know, and when was it on their journey home that it was like, something's missing? What is it? I know there's something. No, I've got my phone. I've got my wallet. Ah, oh, yeah. I know what it is. Yeah. I found my razor. body weight of yeah. sultanas yeah. I was carrying. My raisin d'etre, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, well, it sound, it, the, the story sounds great, as you say. I love how you've tied it all together like that. And, and smells is, is such a big part of that as well, because, you know, yeah. especially when you lose somebody, anything that you've kind of got around that has still kind of got their smell or whatever or some kind of smell that's associated with them is kind of really moving so let's go back a little bit let's let's go back in time a little bit so tell us give us a sense of your background where you grew up and can you remember your kind of earliest memory of writing oh yes well I grew up in Kent and um you know, it's funny because the 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 lovely title of this um, podcast, Joined Up Writing, really, really, really takes me back to small Helen in my primary school. Mm. And I have this really strong memory of um, my classmates being out in the playground and I was in over lunchtime, spending all my time <laughs> trying to make the tops of my letters and the bottoms of my letters fit in the rule of lines. Yeah. Because I had really incredibly messy joined up handwriting. And I don't know whether it's to do with the fact that I'm left handed. And, you know, when you're left handed, you cover the words as you write them. Yeah, so. yeah. But whatever it was, I was just some some sort of act of rebellion. I don't know. But, you know, I remember my teachers used to say at the end of my English essays, you know, well, I you know, I think the ideas in there, you know, were were very good, but <laughs> writing is so messy. Um, so, so my earliest memory of writing is, you know, this I have an absolute passion to write, but also this sort of almost sort of impenetrable, indecipherable writing. Although now, you know, messy in adulthood, sort of messy has morphed into dramatic and flamboyant, you know, which <laughs> yeah. which is great. <laughs> Eccentric. <laughs> Eccentric, yes. I claim them all. I claim messy as well. You know, I like a bit of mess. Um, so as well as writing these messy English essays, I, 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 I you know, as, as 
so many of us do and loved to read. And my mum would always say to me, oh, books are your friends. And, you know, I surrounded myself with these friends. I absolutely surrounded myself. And that was my absolute pleasure to to lose myself in a book. Um, but I also quite liked an audience. So um, a lot of my creative energy went into making up plays um, at first, you know, for my for my toys. And then that sort of, you know, morphed into an audience, you know, because I just carried on making up plays and took me through university and into adulthood. And that's what my whole career has been. So my last 25 odd years of writing has really been, um, the outcome of it has been for, for performance. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a company called Curious um, that I run with my partner, Leslie Hill, and it's been going for 25 years. And through Curious, we've made sort of a range of, um, of, of performance works, sort of video works and um, film works and installation works, and, but predominantly live experimental contemporary live art and performance um and a lot of that work a lot of that work has been autobiographical and personal and quite political and it's also been highly collaborative um you were just talking about smell there the sense of smell and one a project that i did that i absolutely love was um, a collaboration with uh, a smell scientist a pindabala who was in bangalore in india and I wanted to, I was really fascinated by smell and how it connects, like touch, yeah. um, like sort of touch and touching objects, but smell was so strongly, as you were saying, connects with memory and emotion. I mean, literally, that's the part of the brain that it, that, that yeah, smells. Yeah, treats. I think more yeah. than anything else, really. I mean, it's one, one of those, I mean, Billy Connolly always <clears throat> used to talk about you know walking past like a an alleyway in Singapore or something and then just getting hit by this smell and immediately being taken back to his childhood in Glasgow and not knowing what the smell was and sort of following it thinking, well, what is it? Where it, Where am I going? You know, how's it taking me back there? But I know what he means about that because, and sometimes you can't even necessarily identify exactly what it is, but you, you know, you just, you, it's like a time machine, isn't it? It just takes you there straight away. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Totally. It is. It's like, it's like, um, you know, it lets us time travel, you know, so he can be in Singapore, but he's also sort of traveling back through space and time, you know, to mm. Glasgow. Yeah. And that's exactly what it does. And it's, it take it absolutely takes us back to a different, to a different place. And we remember that place. I think, you know, you re-experience a sort of, um, quite physically, like I can, you know, I, you don't just remember the smell, but you remember, you know, so you're suddenly, I'm in, in London, but I have a waft of, you know, the, washing powder that my granny used in her like in her kitchen and suddenly I'm in the kitchen and I'm sitting on the cold flags of the tile you know yeah. and I'm looking at her with, the, with this old-fashioned washing machine it's all there you know it all comes back you know and we reconnect with it on this really sort of cellular and experiential level and and I think that's why and that's why a lot of smell memory I think is really connected with nostalgia and it's really emotive as well and and as you say it's there's an intangibility to it as well so it's there and it's not it's Mm. it's it's elusive and it's intangible and for me there's a lovely correlation between live performance that it that exists in that moment that the performer is there in front of the audience and what i think we are so bereft of at the moment you know what we Mm. realize that that, that, yeah that's so potent about what it is to go to the theater um or, or go to any of the live art because it, it's it's about the story, but it's about that same time, same space, live exchange that is happening right before you and will never happen again in exactly that way. And we we miss that, we grieve that, and we long for our beautiful artists to be able to come back yeah. and be there in front of us. And absolutely, I, I think smell is like that. You know, it, it has that same sort of, you have to be there, you have to breathe there. Do you know, it's beautiful because you can almost like the more you want to smell something like sort of uh, that smell of a you know a lover's perfume and you want you want it was the more you chase after it the more elusive it becomes absolutely yeah and yet at the same time suddenly you can be walking down the street you know and boom it's there and it's mm. physiological and it takes over your whole body and it takes you back you mm. know so it's a wonderful it's an extraordinary and and very creative very rich very potent um uh, sense so um yes so i i i it's it's really interesting that thing of um collaboration you know because i one of the things i love about making performance is collaboration so i love collaborating with this with this smell scientist in india and i've 
collaborated with neurogastroenterologists, you know, on the gut and gut feelings. And, you know, I think we think about theatre and performance as a very collaborative process, you know, working with musicians, with dancers, with singers. But one of the things I've loved about making this sort of, you know, transition into fiction writing is, and it was a surprise to me, but how extraordinarily collaborative that is as well, because in some ways, I presume that to be more of a lone journey, you know, and obviously a lot of it is, you know, sitting, sitting at this desk that I'm sitting at now as I'm talking to you and just like <laughs> making myself stay for hours and hours and hours. Yeah. You know, there's that part, but there's this other part that's extraordinarily and delightfully and generatively um, collaborative that is that is gorgeous and I wasn't expecting that and it's it's yeah I love it yeah well for for people that don't because there might be people that listening to this that you know haven't been published yet or anything else they might be hearing you say that because that was kind of going to be what one of my questions when you're talking about collaboration there a lot of people will be saying yeah but you know you've written the book on your own and as you said you've had to do the hours in the chair in front of the the screen typing away and everything so for people that don't realize give us a sense of how and why it is it does become so collaborative by the end of the process to bring a book to to publication yeah well that's yeah that it, it, it's such it's such a good question um and yeah and one of the i think one of the things i've loved about sort of because it, it's it's new to me writing fiction it's really interesting having had a whole career in something else because i also have I've been a theatre professor and, you know, had my theatre company and now I'm a writer. And it's 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 a, it's lovely to be able to just, in a sense, be a student again, be new to something, you know, and not know how it all works. So I didn't know how it worked at all. You know, I had sort of guesses, but I just thought, well, I know. Well, I've actually, I didn't. I didn't even know if I could write a book, you mm-hmm. know. Um, uh, it's... And it, so we, I think there's something gorgeous about put, putting yourself in that position of not of not knowing and knowing that there are there are people and networks out there for, you know, to help you. And one of the things that I did was I really wholeheartedly let myself become a student. That was the first thing that I did. So the very first thing I did was when I decided I wanted to to write. Um, well, first of all, what I wanted to do was I just sat down and write and wrote a book. That's what I did. I just wrote with just I did just do it by myself. Yeah. And then I got the, you know, that London, the, the hand, the, the, not the London, the handbook of writers. And I went through that big tome, yeah. you know, yeah. and sent it out to agents. And, you know, it didn't it didn't get anywhere except except one agent wrote back to me and she said, I almost I almost took it. And I thought, almost, well, that's really hopeful. I'll have another, <laughs> yeah, I'll have yeah. another go. Yeah. yeah. Because what I had learned by writing that book was that I could do it. I could take something through that narrative arc. And I, so I could do that. And that somebody almost was interested enough. And I thought, well, okay, that's great. I didn't know that before. Yeah. So then next, I thought, oh, so, so what else do I need to do? So I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to let myself be a student. You know, I love, te- I love teaching, but what's it like to put myself on the other side of that and just let myself be a student? And it was brilliant, and I would strongly recommend it, um, to let yourself be a student if you can make the time. And it doesn't always mean about having to have money I have spent money on it and I've done it without spending money on it and I'll tell you the two different sort of avenues Mm. um the first thing that I did was I did like a sort of an evening class I would teach during the day and then I'd run off and morph from being a professor to becoming a student and get this wonderful class by this teacher called Sarah Heltlin a beautiful writer and she's was an incredible teacher so that was 10 weeks and just being part of this um, and so everybody there had other jobs. Was they were ready? They were. They were. This was in California, so they were, most of them were working in Silicon Valley. But um, <laughs> some of them were lawyers. Um, and uh, so we were all. This was all new, new to us. And she was a beautiful, beautiful guide. And it was this incredible, convivial, creative group so we would we would feed we would um, feedback on each other's work every week um and she would give us really great resources and really really wonderful starting points for for writing you know a thousand words and we did so we did homework every week so instantly that gives you a deadline and it gives you a goal and so so that sort of sets the ball rolling as opposed to feeling that you've got this cavern in front of you and you're not quite sure how to fill it so just having the the rigor um and the timetable of a 10-week class was fantastic and so that's 
how I started. And I, you know, there is so much about writing that, of course, is about, you know, imagination and inspiration and bloody, bloody determination. <laughs> yeah. But there's also the fact that there is the craft of it. And I found there was so much to be learned and I had big hunger for that. So then the next thing that I did when I knew that I was returning, because during this time I was living in San Francisco. So my partner and I were returning to London and I applied to the uh, Faber course specifically because now I was looking for something slightly different. I was looking to keep having a creative community of writers because I found that so inspiring mm-hmm. to read and feedback on other people's writing was really helping me write as well as getting their feedback on my writing and I also wanted what the Faber course offered was this sort of entree into what seemed to me at the time and I think does seem when you on your outside of it this very elusive world of agents and publishers um this and it feels impenetrable you know in in many ways and what Faber offer as part of their um, novel writing course is that they publish some of your writing in an anthology and there is a day at the end of the course where they write a selection of, they invite a selection of um, of, uh, of agents. So that's, you know, a, a real entree that I would not have got, you know, sort of off my own bat and one I, that I thought would be really rewarding even if, even if nothing happened and the last property didn't get picked up. Mm-hmm. So that's why I, so that's the next thing that I did. Now, this was a financial commitment and I, I made it, you know, and, um, and it was, it was worth every penny because it gave me everything I wanted and more. I did find this wonderful community of writers, one of whom is um, the, the extraordinary Erica Waller, who's just published um, Dog, Dog Days. Days. Yeah. Yes, with Trans World, who's, who I know has been on this wonderful podcast. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I just loved straight away when I met Erica in in the Faber writing room up there in Bloomsbury, we were at the tea urn. I have a really strong memory of it. And she said, I'm really, I'm really nervous. And I thought, I love you for saying that. I love you for just letting that be part of this. Because, you know, I think we all are when we go into those of new course, yeah. environments, you know, and want to see ourselves as writers, but have all those insecurities about calling ourselves that, especially if we haven't been published. So and I love that honesty that Erica has. And I think that incredible honesty and authenticity is there in her writing and what mm-hmm. makes Dog Day is a heartbreaking, hilarious book that it is, you know. Um, so I was getting everything that I wanted, you know, there were just all of this community of writers, the other 14 students I was with, as, as well as our teacher, you know, was such a great community to have every week. And this was, this was, I think, ugh, I can't remember, was it maybe a six month course? So again, this pattern that you have something that you attend every week and that you need to prepare for, I found really, really um, supportive. And then through the um, through the um, pu- the fact that pub- the the publishers and the Faber and pub- publishers anthology of writing from that I and from the reading day I was lucky enough to um, get my brilliant agent Judith Murray at Green and Heaton and from her get to the world the trans world who are my incredible publishers and uh, Sally Williamson who have done all done a spectacularly good job of getting this property out there. But there are also things that I've done that haven't cost me a penny that have also continued this learning experience, which has been uh, continuing to do, do lessons like Lucy Atkins, the wonderful writer, through all through um, or through part of lockdown, just offered this free um, Instagram class every week. And Marion Keys did one. And the, I really, I really have, um, you know, learned so much from that and also you know Wayne this program I've been you know I was listening to um, I think it was Lauren North talking about a real tenacity and determination with her writing and Becky Robson so was it Becky Robson that did the young yeah novel yeah just hearing other writers talk about real tenacity and just keeping on keeping on and I find that um, part of this whole experience of what it is learning how to become, how, learning how to become um, a writer. I think it's probably you know. I mean, for me, I've been doing this podcast since uh, 2014 now, and um, I think it's obviously I've spoken to people well from all over the world, really. But it's the common themes that just keep coming back, you know. And everybody is 
essentially, regardless of where they start, a lot of people end up going through the same feelings, the same self-doubt, the same, um, you know, imposter syndrome and all the rest of it. And uh, and and all the rejection and the knockbacks that you kind of have to get through as well. And they, they, you know, they're common themes that you hear time after time after time. And in a weird way, it's kind of um, reassuring, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I, it is. It it is reassuring. I mean, you don't you sort of don't want to hear it. Of course not. But, no. But but it does give you. It does sort of give you succor. You know, it does sort of make you think. We are. This is. It's not easy. It is bloody hard work. You know, you know. Um, Marion Keys has written bazillions of novels. She still talks. She still talks about it being really, really, really hard work. You just have to sit there and do it. Mm-hmm. But there is there is something that I find quite boying about hearing other writers being really honest about that and I think that takes me back to your sort of question about collaboration because you know so from the outside when you when you don't know these agents and you don't know these publishers and these editors you know it does seem like this this very this totally different world but when you do manage to have access to it when they do want to meet you when there is something in your book that they are excited about it's phenomenal because what I would want other people who have not yet had that experience to know is that those agents who you sort of nervously, you know, spend like days mm. writing those letters, you know, to try yeah. to get their attention and rewriting those letters and then sending it and then thinking, oh, damn, I should have written something different. You know, all of that angst that you're going to make to make that introduction for yourself in your novel, just to know that those agents are so bloody dedicated yeah. when you actually get to meet them you know and just that these are people that are passionate about passionate about books and they are passionate about writing and they're passionate about finding new voices and new authors and they really will put everything behind that you know like Judith Murray is this, this extraordinary agent you know and I think this is this amazing woman in the world and I'm thinking is she told me she could sell my book and she bloody well did and she you know she you they put all this work in it because they believe in it and once you get to that point then it does become this this world when you meet these people that really are all about how important books are and you know we know this from this last year if nothing else we know how much again you know how much sucker we have got from reading you know and I think that belief in books and that belief in stories and that the world of the imagination and how extraordinarily important it is and these people believe in that and same with the with the editors and the same with the publicists they are out there selling your book and they're passionate about it I remember the first time I had a meeting with a um, uh, a publishing agency and going in there and there was the editor you know who was really fired up and this is a brilliant you know brilliant woman but there are also all these young younger staff members that, uh, who have through from marketing from um you know from publicity who have all just read your book and so suddenly you're in a room it's not just you and your mum and your partner yeah, who read yeah. your book now there's 25 other people who have said this, <laughs> wow yeah who are all talking about you know your character and who are all fired up and you know it's not a perform you know it's not a performance it, there's a genuine because they all they all work and they have to work they're invested like, in it yeah they're invested in it when Exactly, they're invested in it. And when when just I think it's really, I think it's lovely to know that that I think it is there is this incredibly and that's when it is so collaborative because they are finding the right image, they are working on the right copy. Your editor is working with you on every line to make it the best book that they can. Your agent is out there getting the best deal that they can. They are all committed to you and to your book, to your ideas and to your readership. Um and that is I think that is really it's really important to know that that this is a this is a group of people who want to be excited, who want to read the, the work, and who really believe in the power of, of, of books. Absolutely. And <clears throat> when you kind of started the journey, and you say you were on your own, you know, as you are when you're writing that first draft. Do you remember the moment that you finished your first draft, and and how did it feel? When I knew that I just wanted to write and that I was going to finish it even if it never got published I remember being in and this is when I got and I got to the end of it and this wasn't Lost Property this was the book that I wrote before mm-hmm. but this was the book that made it possible for me to write Lost Property I remember and I was just 
I was in my partner was writing a book on suffragettes and she was and it was in this wonderful library and that I couldn't get in because I didn't have the right paperwork and the right credentials so she was inside doing this research for her book and I was outside in Washington Park on a bench and with my laptop and I just wrote I just sat there and waited so I spent the day there and I actually think and I was so lost in the story that at one point a chap actually came up and he urinated along the back of the bench that I was <laughs> uh, <laughs> the thing was Wayne I just sat there and I just carried on writing because yeah. I just was in that world and I'd just given over to it and, and I finished that and I felt I was well that's how that's how delighted I was because I just sat on that same bench in this park all day you know yeah, yeah. getting really sore bum and really pungent aromas <laughs> so there's something about that when you just know that that's the world you want to be in and then with lost property did I know I'd got it you know when I really felt that I'd got lost property was when I found Dot's voice because I knew the setting was rich um, from all those years ago I knew that that was a rich place and because because the book speaks about loss you know, I mean, I think if the book is about the book is about how loss is the price we pay for love, really. So I'm going, I'm going by the a bit off piece now. But my my sort of point was, um, you know, I I think I so I knew I had a good sort of terrain, good material, but it wasn't until I had Dot's voice, that first person voice, that I knew I had my story, and it was that voice that took me through. Um, and got made that first draft possible what what do you think you learned you mentioned there that you kind of you wrote another book before lost property yeah. that I, it was probably sitting in a drawer somewhere or on hard drive like most yeah. most writers what do you think you learned between that book and lost property um i think i learned uh that i but i learned that i could do it that i could take something through to to the end i think i I learned about um, the, 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 the dedication that it takes. Um, I learned how important it is. You know, you think about a room of one's own, that is important, or a urinated bench of one's own, you know, whatever. <laughs> but I, I also think you need to have no internet, no phones, no interruptions. I really think, you know, we are so busy now in that in that busyness of social media. I think that is really, really unhelpful. I mean, I've always been a bit of a wallflower when it comes to social media anyway, but I think I think that thing of really trying to find, even if it's just a small amount of time, having that time that you do not let yourself be distracted by by anything um you know i also think that i if one of the th this is something else from your podcast I, claire beans was talking about um she was talking about you know how you have you come and you write every you know you need to go and write every day and knowing that that final that that paragraph that you write today, you're going to write on it again tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. So it doesn't have to be your be all and end all paragraph. It's just today's paragraph. And I think that is really helpful because I think, as you say, I think there is that sense of imposter syndrome and, and not being good enough. And I think I, mean, I actually think we all suffer from that. I think women particularly suffer from that. And one of the things, you know, one of the things I say to my performance students when I tell them to make a piece of work. You know, I say to them not to be frightened about about work that fails and work that falls on its face and work that stumbles, that in fact, to make the work that flies, they have to be able to make the, the sort of the awkward, ugly, failing work. And in fact, actually, I think some of that awkward, ugly, failing work can have its own beauty and have its own flight path, you know. Yeah. And the other thing I tell them is, and that I, I try and tell myself and that I've tried to tell myself writing less property is not to not to censor yourself you know um and to, to shut that voice that says you're not good enough or the imposter syndrome voice you know shut that outside of the door you know apps to not have that in the room with you and to, to to just not let you don't need that you just have to to believe you know to believe in the writing and 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 to do it you know to, to write by writing you know and to learn to write by writing but yeah, absolutely. So when you sit down to write, yeah. how do you sort of get into the zone? How do you get into the mindset? Or is it much, very much a case of, well, you've got a set time of day or the week or whatever that you do it? 
you know, I actually find it better to, you know, when I was when I was writing Lost Property, I was do, doing lots of other things. I was I was teaching. I was writing in another book that's about a, a performance a theater teaching book. Um, and I was also moving from San Francisco to London. So and I actually think sometimes, you know, and all of us, you know, have very busy lives so sometimes I think not having a lot of time can actually be really help putting that constraint on it you know mm-hmm. sometimes I think you know what can you do in what can you do in a minute what can you do in five minutes what can you do in an hour you know because sometimes if you have a whole day it, you you're not necessarily as efficient but another thing so I think having structuring my time I don't listen I'm not saying that I'm any good at this I'm awful at it you know <laughs> I've been awful through lockdown you know I've just been I'm terrible at, at because I do it's, it's I think this has been a very distracting time. Anyway, yeah. one of the things I do when on a positive note, not about how distracted I get and how dorty I am, but one of the things that has been lovely is that I, a soundtrack is quite important to me. Yeah. Um, when I was when I was writing this property, though, I had um, I had Maria Callas singing this. Oh, it's an extraordinary aria, "Mon cœur s'ouvre à, ta, à toi voix." which is badly translated as my heart opens Mm -hmm. at your voice which is just gorgeous you know and it's just it's incredible you know so I'd listen to it on repeat all day which was great for my writing but like emotionally I'd just be in bits at the end of the day you know (laughs) writing about loss listening to Maria (laughs) Kills um no I'm not doing myself any favors because I've just realized that I sat in this in this what I'm writing at the moment I've got this character who's obsessed with the film brief encounter you know and the soundtrack to that is Rachmaninoff's yeah. piano so it's like <laughs> you're going back yes, there <laughs> I'm really putting myself through it you know I'm just like an emotional wreck by the end of it so when I have to get on my cross trainer again and go back to Tommy in the Swiss Alps and try and work it out you know um, the, the next book after this one I, I'm I'm t- distinctly feeling it's, it's going to be Elvis Presley with a dash of Latin ballroom so I think that that's going to finish <laughs> Yeah, be the the Las Vegas. Exactly, yes. So anyway, that for me has been really helpful. Restrictions on time, and for me it's been really emotive. It helps sort of emotively to have the soundtrack on it relates to the work that I'm doing. So as we kind of move towards wrapping things up, if you were starting again tomorrow as a new writer um, and you were starting out on that first book and you're starting out on the journey, what, if anything, would you do differently or what would you go back and tell your younger self? To, to to absolutely give yourself the time and space to do it. If you want to write a book, don't put all of those things that you think I need to have this. I should have done that. I never went to work. Don't put any of that there. Just that fact. Just pay attention. Pay attention to that desire, and be true to it. You know, just do that, and just give over to it, and find the time, and make the time, and and let and let yourself be a student of writing as well in any way that you can whether it's buying a really good writing book or whether it's getting a creative community of fellow writers and sharing work um or whether it's treating yourself to do a course whatever it is let yourself be a student and also let yourself be a writer let yourself be a writer you know and don't put any of those restrictions about you and and do also lock that bloody sensor sensorial voice outside of the room and allow yourself to to trip up and write stuff that's not good because if you do that i think you will absolutely write the work that is good you'll get to the good stuff you will get to the good stuff you absolutely will yeah and and i think also just knowing it's going to be bloody hard and bloody hard work and that that is that is part of it i think sometimes that and sometimes it can be helpful i mean it sounds like it's a real downer but i just think knowing that's what you're going in for and to expect that and that doesn't mean you're not a good writer it doesn't mean that you can't write it doesn't mean you won't finish it just means that, that is part of the journey you have to go on absolutely well that's great advice so as we kind of wrap things up can you just give us a sense of what the next project is i'm not asking you to tell us everything because obviously you're still writing it um but also tell people where they can find out more about you online Oh, thank you. Um, well, what I'm writing at the moment whilst I'm listening to Rachmaninoff on repeat <laughs> is a piece that is set on an allotment. And it's very much about female friendship. And it's also about age and how um, age erases, a, particularly, I think, erases women, I think particularly um, mid, middle-aged women, and then all the way up to 
retirement and beyond i think you know there's an invisibility there and so the book is looking at that and, and very much about the strength of women's friendships um and you can find me on um i have a website which is really for my theater company which is curiousperformance.com on instagram i'm helen francis paris and on twitter I'm, i've ended up with Dr. Helen Paris, the, which I was bitterly regret, you know, but I was trying so hard to get, even I was putting Helen Francis. That sounds Helen, pretty cool, to be fair. Yes, well, I think it raises expectations, really. And, um, <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that, Helen. You'll, you'll, you'll meet so them, it'll be fine. You'll exceed those expectations. <laughs> oh, so that's how you can find me, Wayne. And thank you so much for finding me and letting me be on this programme. I have found this such an inspiring programme. I really do. I put this on when I go on my exercise machine. I listen to these extraordinary writers um talking about their process really honestly and i I found it that has been part of my learning to be a writer so i'm very grateful to you thank you well thank you very much that's very kind of you to say well thanks for coming on helen really appreciate it it's been great to talk to you but for now thanks for coming on joined up writing thanks rain bye-bye There you go. Thanks again to Helen Paris, and I'll put all of her links in the show notes over at joinedupwriting.co.uk. That pretty much wraps it up for this week, but don't forget you can get in touch with all your thoughts on the show, feedback, and to tell me what's going on in your writing world. And you can do that by dropping me an email at wayne at waynekellywrites.com. Also, remember you can find the entire back catalogue of interviews on the website. Make sure you subscribe at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, Overcast or wherever else you get your podcasts from and that way you can have the podcast downloaded automatically every week. Also remember to leave us a nice rating and review on Apple Podcasts because it really does help others to find the show or just recommend it to one of your friends. So that's it for this week. Don't forget to get in touch. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I'm Wayne Kelly. Happy writing, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.